Airing on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 in so-called Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating from Occupy's Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week our guests are Sam and Alex, not their real names. Sam was until recently the co-host of the 12 Rules for What podcast and is the co-author with Alex of two books, The Post-Internet Far Right and The Rise of Ecofascism. Sam is now focused on writing Collapsology Substack and the Collapse podcast. And you can support Alex's ongoing work with the 12 Rules for What podcast via their Patreon or check out their podcast on Apple Podcasts or the Channel Zero Network. Check the show notes for links. If you're looking for the transcript of this episode, it should be out at the time of release, along with zines that you can easily print. But first, a couple of brief announcements. Anarchist Black Cross in Indonesia, Palang Itam, is fundraising for a paralegal training that they're going to be doing for anarchists and anti-authoritarians who can learn more and contribute at firefund.net slash P-A-L-A-N-G-H-I-T-A-M. Anti-racist communist prisoner held in North Carolina, James Shine White Stewart, is facing severe repression and deprivation at Maori CI, where he was recently transferred. He's been in solitary since he was transferred, denied food and blood pressure medicine, and has had various pieces of property and correspondence stolen, as well as mail tampered with. He's asking people to make urgent calls and emails to Secretary Eddie M. Buffalo, that's Buffalo with an E at the end, of the North Carolina Department of Public Safety in order to demand Shine White's transfer out of state, called an interstate compact, to West Virginia. You can reach Eddie at 919-733-4080 or via eddie.buffaloe at ncdps.gov. Shine White also wanted to share that his politics have evolved in such a way that they are no longer in alignment with the Revolutionary Intercommunal White Panther Organization, RIWPO. Um, so he's stepping down from his role as a national spokesperson for that organization. However, Shine White still believes deeply in intercommunalism and the liberatory vision of the Revolutionary Intercommunal Black Panther Party. If you're in the Southeast, and if you're in Southern Appalachia, uh, there's a rally next Thursday at 11 a.m. at the Justice A.A. Birch Building in Nashville to protest the abortion ban in Tennessee. Others in the area, you should keep an ear out for demonstrations in South Carolina despite the overturning of the six-week abortion ban and because of the 20-week abortion ban um, now in effect in North Carolina. More on the latter two pieces of news and ways to support folks seeking abortions in the Carolinas at L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Carolina Abortion Fund. There's going to be a benefit party and queer country show at the Auditorium in Asheville on Wednesday, August 31st from Firestorms, just across the street from Firestorms' new building that they're going to be moving into in the next six months or so, which is very exciting that they bought. So this fundraiser is going to come, going to go to help support the purchase and renovation of that property. It runs from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m., and you can find out more by checking their social media accounts, usually at Firestorm Co-op. Finally, we've been forgetting to announce every month, but on Sunday, September 4th, at the West Asheville Park from 3 to 5 p.m., you can find Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross writing to prisoners. They'll provide you a list with political prisoners with upcoming birthdays or prisoners currently facing repression who could use some words of support, plus paper, pens, and addresses. Come down, meet some folks, and send some love behind bars. Would you please introduce yourselves for the audience with any names, preferred pronouns, or other information about yourselves that you care to share? Yes, my name is, is Sam Moore. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. And I think and so someone asked me this the other day if there's any information I need to share about myself or like what my background is. But this is, of course, a pseudonym. <laughs> so this is not my real name. Uh, and so I, I guess the information that we have about ourselves 
both of us is that we are the uh or we were until very recently the the co-hosts of a podcast called 12 rules for what and the authors of two books uh post-internet far right and the rise of ecofascism but i'll let alex say if he wants to dox himself any further than that and uh yeah i'm alex and i use he him pronouns and i am also the co-author of the those two books <laughs> and um i am still the host of 12 rules for what and yeah. I think we're well, we're both activists, anti-fascist activists, and researchers as well. Awesome. Great. So I'm excited to have you all on the show. Um, I've been an avid listener of their podcast since you joined the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. Regular listeners to our show may be familiar with your amazing jingle, but for folks who aren't familiar with the Twelve Rules for What podcast, as the shared project that you know this is the books are coming out of, can you speak a bit, give a brief rundown on the project, its scope, and its its goals moving forward from here so maybe i could do the history because I've, I've now left the project as of about two weeks ago um i'll just say what it was when i was involved and now alex, now alex can tell you all about what it will become when it becomes uh, its full self in the future so starting in 2018 there was a kind of a notable absence in the uk anti-fascist movement of understanding of the far right and the different ways in which it had been shifting and moving and changing and adapting to the conditions of the internet and adapting to the kind of different social forces that were at play on the far right uh, in the UK at that time. It's quite a peculiar time uh, for the far right in some ways through the Cameron period. So that's from 2010 to 2016 when David Cameron was the prime minister. There had been a a large street movement called the EDL, uh, which had started actually a bit before that. But the basic idea of the EDL was that it was called it was the English Defence League and it was a kind of an obviously far right but also quite inchoate and quite complex movement it was often accused of being fascist I think for a lot of people felt it was quite an apt description I don't think it was necessarily retrospectively but I think it was it was a pretty decent description at the time and its politics were militantly Islamophobic hatred of Muslims was its kind of its ruling idea however in 2017 and 2018 there was a kind of a shift so the EDL started to decline, started to not become the kind of the, the most important figure or a kind of component of the UK far right. And it was replaced partially because it's very charismatic leader, Tory Robinson, um, left to do other things and became a kind of a, a news grifter or a kind of a, a kind of what he described as a citizen journalist. And and he got into various legal troubles and there was a movement around him being kind of released from prison where he was, he was put for uh, <laughs> obvious breaches of uh, contempt of court and, and various other kind of problems he ran into. And that meant that the EDL, which is this kind of clear, defined center of gravity on the UK far right, started to dissolve. It's also true that on the more kind of um, parliamentary wing of the far right, or not parliamentary because they weren't in parliament, but the more electoral wing of the far right, UKIP, Brexit, and so on, had basically won. But there was this kind of contestation of what Brexit was supposed to now mean. Um, and that meant that all kinds of other things were being pulled into the orbit of the far right, uh, and all, lots of different kind of things were at play at once. And so 12 Rules for What, just to get to that very long end of that history, 12 Rules for What is to understand this conjuncture and the histories that conformed it, the ways in which the far right had changed its political forms, where in which it changed the way it organised over the previous 10 years of the rise of the internet and so on, in order to get away from the stereotypes of the far right, which people had held, which is that all, they're all neo-Nazis, which is not true, or that they're all like kind of just conservatives, which is also not true, Right. And so we need to go differentiate, to pull those things apart, and to see what we could do then as anti-fascists in order to counter them. Uh, Yeah, I would echo that history. I would also say that it was also an attempt to, uh, I suppose, having an audience was, was, you know, having a broader audience was was a good thing, is a good thing that we've got. Um, But we were mainly trying to talk to uh, the anti-fascist movement as it was in the UK, which, because of the kind of, misunderstandings i suppose or misconceptions about what the far right how the far right was currently constituting or constituting at the time um there was kind of a failure to act in a in a way that would properly oppose those forces which obviously needed opposing as uh, anti-fascists needed to oppose them and so from the start we also had discussions about anti-fascism about movements and how you build movements as well so yeah, it was it was a it was there was two components to it. It was it was talking about the far right, but also about anti-fascism as well, which oftentimes it goes really uninterrogated. 
as a kind of form of political activity. And we wanted to discuss that. And now moving forward, have those like, are you continuing in the same trajectory now that Sam has left the show, Alex? Yeah, I think we did some really, really good stuff. Um, and I want to continue doing good stuff. It's not like uh, I have, a, I don't really have a, that radically different um, positions from Sam. We agree. And I think you kind of have to agree to write the kind of books we did. Uh, so, yeah. I don't really. Uh, there's not going to be massive yeah. divergence. If, if people are looking for kind of kind of um, gossip about like the kind of the collapse of Twelve Rules, I'm afraid there's very little. <laughs> what there is is just a a sense from me that we had completed the project to some extent that we want to set out to do. I think if you read our two books, there's a really quite good account of the far right in those books, in like scholarly areas. You know, the one thing everyone agrees at an academic conference is that there must be another academic conference. But like, I also think that you can get to the end of something. And I think for, for my part, I got to the end of like that. I'm sure Alex will produce things that I could never have conceived of. But like, nevertheless, I, I feel like I've come to the end of the, the explosion of the far right. And that's kind of it. I suppose there's a difference there because I, I still care about the far right and I think it's important to oppose, whereas Sam has moved on to... Oh yeah, he's gone fascist. You know, that would you uh, all agree oh, on. Yeah, so this is the- <laughs> he's, he was always a Nazi, he just he never Social declared fascist. it properly, you know. Yeah, 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 the SDP. <laughs> I, I was just reflecting on that a bit more seriously. I was thinking about, was it worth doing on my own? And I... I was like 50-50 about whether to carry on with it and I kind of got persuaded by a few people a few people in the anti-fascist movement who described it as like a a, re, a, re, a movement resource. I think it has value in it in itself of, of being a reflective space for anti-fascists in the UK and, and elsewhere as well. Sam, you mentioned that you're not going to be working on the podcast anymore. I wonder if you could, um, if you want to shout out your other podcast and the newsletter that you're moving along with Collapse and maybe introduce listeners who haven't heard it um, to what it is and also tell us what the hell a Substack is. Yeah, so I was mentioning that part of the kind of interesting thing about the far right in 2018 was they had won Brexit, but they didn't know what Brexit meant. And of course, there's this like wonderfully surreal answer from Theresa May, who was the prime minister, um, actually I can't remember when, from 2016 to about 2018, 2019 perhaps, when she says, Brexit means Brexit, which is like just beautifully kind of circular. I mean, it's very clear that we didn't know what Brexit was supposed to be. And so there was this kind of sense that across the political spectrum, and including on the far right, lots of people were trying to work out what they, would, what they thought they meant by Brexit, and therefore impose something on it. It seems to me that the, the basic kind of political fact of the rest of our lives uh, will be climate change, right? And that will um, entail not only hotter summers, like we're currently going through in the UK, we now have a summer, which is a new thing for the UK, but also it will entail possibly social collapse, um, something quite slow, but nevertheless quite sustained. I think that's a fairly likely interpretation of what may happen. And so that event will happen, but it will also, just like Brexit, require someone to give it some meaning, require someone to like articulate what that collapse is, what its story is, what it's supposed to we're supposed to do now, and so on. And it seemed to me that the the, the prudent thing, or the, the long range strategic thing, for the left, is to consider what its politics would be, what left wing politics would be, given that basic fact, given the need for extraordinary le- levels in, of solidarity over the next say century, uh, internationally, but also given the need to I think rearticulate a politics that doesn't contain some sort of brilliant utopia, right, where everything is saved, where everything is transformed. You know, a politics that essentially is without a future, but nevertheless is hopeful in some other sense. And if that sounds like a contradiction in terms, or that sounds like it's not going to, like I, I don't have the, the specifics worked out, that's because I don't. So the project is to try and find our way to a political theory adequate to our moment of collapse without simply saying everything is different now and without saying everything is the same as it always was and we can just carry on as if the left was in the 20th century or the 19th century or like we're all heading you know towards the sunny uplands of the future forever like these are not the facts so you know that's the project of, of thinking about collapse now i think i think you've definitely set yourself up with a very large project that'll keep you busy for a long time that's really fascinating though <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i've only i've only gotten around to listening to that i've been cutting back on podcasts actually but um but listening to the first episode was like the introduction that was in the 12 rules um stream was really interesting so i'm looking forward to that 
Great. So, uh, as you've mentioned, you've published two books over the last two years, Post-Internet Far Right, Fascism in the Age of the Internet from Dog Section Press 2021, as well as uh, The Rise of Ecofascism, Climate Change and the Far Right from Polity Press 2022. First up, congratulations to both of you on this. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, what's well Alex? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, Post-Internet Far Right, I might call it PIFR. Um, for here on out, just um, but I'll try to correct myself. I shortened it for Piffer. Piffer. You can call it Piffer. I was if afraid you... if I called it Piffer, you'd give me a weird look. So I'm going to call it Piffer. Some people call it Piffer. I call it Piffer. So, I call it Piffer. So Piff, Piff is a piece of genuine UK slang, which you can use. Um, so maybe, we'll, maybe I'll tell you what that means afterwards. <laughs> yeah, please. Take some time to think up what it means. Um, so Piffer <laughs> kind of felt like a, <laughs> a theme park ride. If you don't mind me saying, it was a sort of a not-so-fun house. The reader passes through on a on a boat as monsters pop up along the way. A presentation of, ra- of relationality of organizations, events, and modalities. But also, um, you know, taking place in a timeline. And that seems kind of like an appropriate approach to setting the development and stage of important questions of how to counter the far right while attempting to avoid the pitfalls of writing a thousand page academic treatise or or homogenizing all the um, all the subject matters by saying everyone's fascist that we don't like you know and I, I do want to note that while I you know I made that little kind of crappy metaphor or whatever of uh, the monster house it's a great uh, metaphor. I don't mean to say <laughs> thank you very much you can use it if you want to um, Next, second edition, you can put that on the back of it. Uh, it's. Um, I don't mean to say that the approach was a menagerie of freaks, um, to use a phrase that I think of, I'm paraphrasing from what you've said on the show before, the focus on like individual instances or events or, or people, personalities that tend to draw a lot of, you know, shallow recognition and attention from people. Um, but m- more as like a mapping of an ecosystem of relationships. So f- first up, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about this approach to writing your book, um, how you sort of uh, created this wending path to take the readers on, um, and and share your definitions of terms like far right and and, and far right and fascist. Why is it important to, to be clear about your language when talking about our enemies? Well, I think the, the structure of the book is quite deliberate and we, we start off with um, a chapter on feelings um, and kind of the very kind of kind of blobby feelings you get when you're online and, and depressed or online and angry. Uh, and we kind of expand out from that very individual, uh, very singular point of reference inside someone's head and what they kind of, their individual feelings out to ultimately eco-fascism and the end of the world. And, you know, in that gap, we kind of trace a journey of expanding far-right variation, basically. Um, and we wanted to do that because oftentimes people see um, these different scales on, on like, a level on their own. There's no, like, um, connecting them together. There's no understanding how someone could be radicalised and what that could mean and how that radicalization then tra- transfers to more real world quote unquote political action oftentimes it's the neo nazi teenager who commits a, a mass atrocity has is kind of sprung up out of these kind of very pat very rote kind of reasons for radicalization like um you know he was bullied or he you know was or autistic he or he was or he saw some uh, bad memes and then went bad uh, and we wanted to understand how you know, how someone can go through a process. And oftentimes it's a quite a very short process as well. Like, it's not like there's this, this idea of the pipeline. And we wanted to introduce other kind of mechanisms in which people could become uh, fascists or far-right, members of the far-right or Nazis or whatever. And so we talk also about kind of ruptures. We talk about breaks in people's kind of political thinking and political activity, uh, just as much as a kind of slow, steady pipeline, which we think is has been the go-to quite easy answer um for a lot of these questions yeah i mean so i think the 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 argument of the book is the structure of the book they're the same thing so um it is a winding path but i think it's supposed to be also just an an ascent through a collection of ways in which um these kind of as alex was saying i think this is a really good phrase uh, a blobby feelings right like there's a certain sense of numinous just like things gliding inside you if you ever just like sat for a long time 
or even just like a short while and just thought about the kind of various things that are going on inside you, um, which I recommend doing, they are indeterminate. They are vague. They are um, inexpressive. And so politics can't just rely on them kind of being fully formed. It has to like, um, I think we say in the book, it has to like make them march. Right? The, 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 and the purpose of the, the kind of the infrastructure of the far right that we, that we explore through the first few chapters after the feelings one is the things that would, would make these feelings politi- politicized, essentially, will make them able to reproduce themselves, will provide a community in which they live, will provide means for which they can be disseminated throughout the world and so on. So those are all the kind of the different aspects of that. And that, that loops through, you know, um, action on the streets in the kind of classical fascist mode. It loops through online communities. It loops through um, joining organizations, uh, most prominently right now in the UK, Patriotic Alternative, most prominently perhaps in the US, Patriot Front, uh, but also the Proud Boys and other kind of things like that. And so there, there are all these kind of ways in which these feelings are reproduced, remade, politicized, articulated, drawn out, and so on. On this thing about the precision of terminology, about like the far right and fascism, in that book, we actually don't give a good definition of either. We do note there are gradations. I should say the definitions in the eco-fascism book are excellent. <laughs> so it's not that we've kind of shirked that, it's just that we de- delayed it for another book. So the, the, the need for a precise terminology is not because the world is full of precise objects which are easily categorized and easily like found, uh, easily kind of put in, in their place. The reason for precise terminology is strategic, right? The need for that is, is so that you can do something with the object, right? You, you've got to imagine like a... I'm trying to think of the right metaphor. So on a coastal wall, on a wall next to the sea, right, they get these measurements. It's like, this is how far the tide is up. This is how far the tide is up. This is how far the tide is up. And they have numbers on them. But politi- politics isn't like that. You can't say, oh, this person is this radical, seven out of 10 radical. This person is nine out of 10 radical. This person is 10 out of 10 radical. You really need to be worried. Like, th- th- these, this is not possible. Partially because the coastal wall itself is going up and down. Like, it's kind of sinking. It's kind of moving up and down all the time. There's kind of warps in the wall and the way the measurement works and it doesn't quite work. But at least what the precision of the terminology gives you is a sense of how the dynamics of the, the sea are changing or something. This metaphor is really torturous. It's making your metaphor about the funhouse seem exceptionally crystal clear. Although I think it's a really good metaphor, actually. I really do like it. So the idea is that it's not the world is precise, but the world is very messy and there's a need to like strategize about the world in order to bring it into its clarity. Not because the clarity pre-exists and is out there and you just kind of like go and find it, but because politics is a matter of making clear, making distinctions, making like uh, organizing the world in a certain kind of uh, way. And and that requires you to think in a, in a certain kind of strategic way as well. There's also there's a kind of trap when, just to quickly before we get into our actual definition, which Sam's going to give because I can't remember what we actually wrote. The point of being very definite and, and clear and defined is, is, is oftentimes there's a tendency on, on the radical left within anti-fascist movements and indeed even in wider society is the way to label something as a bad thing that we must reject wholeheartedly is to, is to label it a fascist thing. And it's, this is really tricky because then you start kind of merging lots of different things together into one label, which is very unuseful in opposing, in opposing all different kinds of stuff. So, you know, the, the, oftentimes people talk about the transphobes, TERFs being fascists. And it's like, okay, you, we can acknowledge the relationships that um, transphobic radical feminists have with, for example, the kind of Christian, evangelical, quite right-wing, massively right-wing groups in America and, well, the UK ones. And, you know, we can acknowledge those alliances without, you know, kind of putting them together, putting these people who are, you know, self-identify as feminists in with people who definitely don't self-identify as feminists. And, and so this is obviously not a defence of transphobia or transphobes, it's to acknowledge that there are things that are not fascist which are also awful and should be opposed and, and, and fought against and worked against as well. And so oftentimes, in certain kind of, I suppose, more liberal strains of anti-fascism as well, the kind of mass terror of the border, for example, or the mass terror of prisons, the prison system, or of policing in general, is kind of put into the realm of acceptability uh, because it's not it, it's it's non-fascist and it's not the, the border isn't fascist it's part of you know the ongoing mechanisms of neoliberal capitalism you know it's it's the norm it's not a fascist thing it's a it's a it's a liberal capitalist thing and so to draw in all of the other stuff into our critique um our, our critiques 
um, we need to be very clear about what they are and what they aren't. You know, we've said, and big, this has been a big theme for the show, is that, you know, where is the biggest harm, societal harm being caused on the kind of broad spectrum of the right? You know, you can look at something like Atomwaffen, you know, they did murders, but they, they kind of mainly murdered each other, uh, which is, you know, Sam's line, <laughs> I still. The, the biggest threat on the right comes from, you know, border force or, you know, Repu- the Republican Party or the, the over- overthrow of Roe versus Wade and the abolition, uh, the abolition of abortion in, in you know, half the states of America. Uh, and so that's where we need to acknowledge that that stuff is not necessarily fascist, but also that it should be, you know, vehemently um, opposed. One thing I share about is kind of the danger of the, the thing I was mentioning before about the kind of the strategy is that you get into the same kind of traps that Alex is talking about when you pursue that notion of a strategic definition too far. Because then what you do is you decide that whatever you are capable of opposing must be fascism, right? So if you're really good at like setting the discourse on Twitter, uh, if you, if that's what you've got as a, as a movement, then you're going to decide that the things you need to oppose are part of the discourse on Twitter. And if you're really good at opposing street movements, then you're going to decide that the thing you need to oppose is street movements. Or if you have like a legal apparatus that you're very good at, you're going to decide that the thing you need to oppose is the legal apparatus. And so in, in some sense, although I've argued in favor of a strict strategicness or a, a kind of a, a use of kind of a, a political strategy to guide definitions, at the same time, I think it's essential that we don't simply just decide that whatever we happen to have must be the right answer because uh, the far right is always changing, right? And so all you're going to, you're going to build up capacity to oppose one part of it. It's going to change. And then you're going to be stuck opposing an iteration of it that was, that was in the past. There are some really key examples of this in the UK in particular, but I don't want to open old wounds, uh, with, uh, with the audience. So uh, maybe I won't go into that. Like anti-fascism in the United States conception and the way that it could be adopted by a lot of people who were liberals and who were radical leftists and who are whatever, who are radical centrists, is because they can point to this one historical example where, you know, in the 1940s, the U.S. sent military across the ocean, and then they fought against this, like, absolute evil above all other evils. And so either something equates with that absolute evil or it doesn't. It also puts us in the same in the same boat, as it were, as the institution that was continuing to impose Jim Crow at that period of time in the U.S. South and um, supporting redlining in northern states and 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 such. So, yeah. OK, I, I think I think it gets to gets to like a conception of the global far right. So it's, it's, it's important. I mean, particularly people now are thinking about the way in which, for example, uh, the government of Modi and the government of Bolsonaro and the you know, erstwhile government of, of, of Trump in America and the various other far right movements around the world. Like, how do they all intersect? How do they kind of how do tactics flow between them? How can we make linkages? That was as true for the historical things you're talking about, right? Like, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting book. I'm not going to affirm it totally, but like an interesting book called Hitler's America Model, which looks at the way in which certain aspects of, of, of race law in, in the US um, were implemented by the Nazis to the extent that some of the Nazis, even quite senior Nazis, uh, at some points regard the US as having gone too far, which is, of course, not historically how it's borne out. There's no, it will not be correct to like equate Jim Crow with the Holocaust, right? But they, but they are. Um, but the reservation system, the the use of um, at times like smallpox bre- blankets, like yeah, yeah. So most of the time, most of the the things they draw directly are, are actually about um, the policing of Black Americans. Um, rather than the you know, reservation system and so on, because uh, when the Nazis are doing this in the 1930s, they have, these are they regard uh, the indigenous population as essentially kind of a, a vanished thing. They regard it as like kind of, in some ways, in terminal and inevitable decline, a, a kind of a defeated race. And yeah, it's interesting that to some extent, actually, the indigenous peoples of America are treated as a kind of a warning for um, Germans what will befall them if they do not fight for their racial superiority, right? They will be crushed as they see the indigenous Americans as having, having been. So yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole kind of complex history there about the way in which they, they understand, again, this question of like political events and then their, their interpretation, their meaning that comes later. Yeah, there's a whole question about how they understand um, the genocide of the Americas as both a, a glorious achievement of the white people and also simultaneously as a warning of what will befall them. Yeah, that, that whole like holding yourself as a as a discriminated or um, oppressed population simultaneous to uh, viewing yourself as being 
Superman and Elite and whatever. I'd like to get back to that in a in a upcoming question. I guess pivoting a little bit. So technology and online sociality have shaped how the far right organizes as well as everyone else in society, um, and in some surface ways, what it looks like. Uh, Alex set a challenge in a 2019 episode of Dissident Island, unless I'm getting that wrong, um, in the wake of the Christchurch shooting for anti-fascists to understand the new spheres of radicalization um, that were visibilized by that tragedy for a lot of us. Um, I feel like Piffer was meant to be a tool to further that challenge. And as more and more interaction is occurring online, especially like through the COVID pandemic and with new platforms, there's a continual need to grow and learn that terrain. Wondering if you can talk a little bit about some of the shifts in um, anti-fascist activism, how you feel the movements have done a la the far right and fash and counter-organizing online. And are there any projects you know that are working on the cutting edge, delving into challenging the spread of fashy ideas, for instance, in virtual or augmented reality situations? Do you want to go? You go first. I went first last time. How, how well did we kind of sculpt the internet? Or like, how well do we understand the internet in that book? Well, the book is, is now one year old, which means that it was written two years ago. And therefore the internet has changed immeasurably since then. <laughs> There's always this sense that one is kind of discussing something that, is, that has happened a long time ago in the past when, when trying to talk about kind of the dynamics of internet spaces. One thing that's happened in particular is the kind of the uneven distribution of things like Discord servers, just like to be really concrete about it. Like people that the far are using Discord servers like more than they were when we first started writing the book, but like, they're also using Discord servers less than they were at the peak of the book because Discord had a kind of clampdown. Its terms and conditions uh, started to actually like impose them as opposed to being kind of more or less laissez faire. Telegram continues to be an important way, place where the far right meet. But I think we shouldn't get too kind of fo focused on like exactly what the, the internet space is supposed to tell us about the far right in general. Like what is they're supposed to like inform us about? I think we described in the, the book, we talked about a kind of a, a realm of affordances, right? There's a kind of a sense of in which um, an affordance is, 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 is like, it's a thing in an object or a thing in, in, in an environment that presents itself to you as an opportunity for you to do something. So for example, I'm holding how a mug, but like, um, it's very obvious that the way I'm holding the mug is the wrong way to hold the mug, <laughs> right? The handle is here. And I'm supposed to hold the mug by the handle, right? Um, this object has been designed to have an affordance that I can choose to pick up or not. But as you can see, I'm holding the, the wrong way. And that's important because in some ways, the way the internet is designed is as a collection of affordances for action, right? Like the share button kind of looms very large. It's like, please share this thing. And there's a, there's a consistent vocabulary across websites and across you know, designs of operating systems and so on to make everything very easy to use. But it's like you're kind of in an environment where the whole of the thing, everything around you is like, this kind of big handle kind of offer, offering itself to you kind of flashing or something so the space is extremely designed and nevertheless it's totally possible like it is with the mug to just like use it wrong and to use it against the grain and so on and so i think there's been excess at least in the liberal press about the kind of determinism of technology over fire politics i think of some really heinous articles uh for example the article in rolling stone about 4chan for example which declares that 4chan is is the kind of this uh the, the the posts are displayed according to a kind of an arcane logic of, of of kind of impossible to work out for mere mortals it's like guys man, they're in they're in they're in chronological order <laughs> the, the top post is the most recent one <laughs> and then it goes down it's, it's not that hard to work out and so there's this kind of this this, this mystification of the internet right that, that that i think happens in lots of the press and we were trying to cut through that because you're on the internet you know what it's like on the internet and then you read an article and you're like, that's not what I'd like, like to be on the internet. So how does the far right use the internet now? I couldn't tell you because I stopped doing this stuff some time ago, but Alex did not. So he could tell you. Okay. So how do you think anti-fascist have, 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 how well have they done the counting, countering the far right online? I think it's a tricky question to answer because how do you define, you know, successful opposition online? One kind of marker of success, of course, is deplatforming. So, like, a certain prominent far right account is taken down. There is cause for celebration. People move on to the next one. Um, there's oftentimes also like the internet is a mechanism for disseminating information. You know, people dox people. It's shared widely. There is some kind of regulatory um, pressure on that person to stop 
being a fascist, I'll stop being a Nazi, I'll stop being on the far right and things like this. I think what we need to acknowledge is that who, like, the fact that the internet is owned by these giant uh, companies and these very rich people is something we can't ever get away from. And so, you know, we've always talked about just on its own, you know, appealing to our internet masters to delete certain um, fascist or objectionable people from from their platforms. And that can only be one tiny, tiny part of what we need to do. Ultimately, in my opinion, the way anti-fascism is successful is building movements offline, you know, street movements, um, investigatory collectives, uh, whatever, um, in order to, um, I suppose, bring a kind of opposition into the real world, or quote unquote. In, in, in terms of doxing, I think, you know, it is really useful to be able to spread awareness about a particular individual or a particular organiser. I think we do need to be careful about, and I think this is a particularly American anti-fascist movement phenomenon of just basically doxing anyone any member of any organisation, of any far-right organisation, as a rote thing, as a thing that must happen. And the kind of problem with that is that it, ha- it has some kind of disciplinary function. Some of those people who are doxxed will stop being fascist. But if there's, if there's a doxing without consequence, then it starts to lose a lot of its power as well. Um, and, and so people, what you end up creating is a, is a movement of out and proud Nazis who don't mind being very, very fascist in their public lives in... Uh, online, wherever, and then you have a problem which needs to be opposed in a, in a different way. So, basically, I'm just coming back to the fact that it's difficult, to, quite difficult to measure uh, a successful online opposition um, because the internet is ever changing and ever moving around. There's a sense in which you can kind of like push things. It's like a kind of a, a system with like lots of little kind of lots of water in or something, and you kind of squeeze one part of it, and the water just flows somewhere else. But you can't compress the water; you can't like, get rid of it. But I think that's a bit. I don't know, it's a bit, bit pessimistic. I think maybe as a, as a metaphor. Um, I should say that in addition to, I mean, I am less skeptical than Alex of the utility and power of large companies to moderate things that are on their platforms. After the Christchurch shooting, there was a thing called the Christchurch Call, which was began by the governments of New Zealand and France, signed onto by Facebook, Google, you know, all these different kind of big big internet companies. They've done a relatively good job uh, at uh, at removing some extremist content. Definitely, like the more kind of terroristic and neo-Nazi elements of things, have been pretty effectively removed because of that, and that is a serious victory. I am, of course, also slightly worried about the kind of the creeping state that kind of comes and does your anti-fascism for you. But I should say, like, of course, in Europe we have models of anti-fascist states that are constitutionally anti-fascist. Germany is the most obvious example, right? Like, it is illegal to be fascist in Germany, uh, and the German police enforce that law very strictly. It's not easy to be like a, to be a neo-Nazi in Germany for very good reasons. And I don't think that the German state implodes that law upon the left, I don't, as far as I'm aware. I, like, I don't think there's ever been the kind of example of that happening. So I'm, I maybe mean, this is something particular about Germany that like other countries wouldn't do as do as well. At, but I'm I'm less terrified of the, of the of the of the powers of the state and giving them 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 more capacity to to organise civil society. Why am I saying this? Maybe I don't believe any of that, but I've said it now, so I'm going to just stick with it. Out of pure stubbornness. But I think that there's, like, while it may be difficult to be a fash, like an out-and-out fash in the way that, you know, you're not, people aren't marching around Germany for the most part flying Nazi flags. However, you did have, you've had this ongoing crisis where it turns out that members of security forces have been participating in secret telegram totally. groups <laughs> yes. and organizing among themselves. And, and Or then you've got people that are flying some old pre-existing like German flag in replacement of the Nazi flag. And it technically doesn't, you know, check that marks on the box. But until somebody can, you know, and showing up at QAnon events, until somebody can write that into law, then the government's unable to respond to it in that way. Well, I mean, that's kind of it's. I guess what I'm wondering also, uh, in in addition to what you all have said, is uh, not so much, and as it's been pointed out, you compress a thing and then the water comes out in different places. It seems like the building of the skill set of being able to address the changes as they occur by by trying to look for innovation on far-right uses of the internet, not just not just looking at new platforms, but and not just breaking in encryption or like find, actually just finding like weaknesses in code to to get the contents of whatever Discord or Rocket Chat is happening. But I wonder if there's any um, groups that you're aware of online 
or networks that are public that have been pretty good about keeping an eye on developments in far-right applications of technology for organizing? It's okay if you don't. I would say that the leaks that have come and been published by people like Unicorn Riot, for example, there is kind of like has been really useful to researchers. And there's, there, is a, there is a contingent, I would say, of, of kind of anti-fascists online who have the ability to, to breach some of these platforms or at least get into these spaces like discords. And that has proved very useful. Like the, the leaking of the, um, for example, of the Iron March forum, all the messages, all the DMs, all the profiles has been materially useful to investigators in the UK, for example, um, researching stuff that had come out come out past uh, national action after that was prescribed. So those kinds of, as a society, we still haven't particularly worked out how to, uh, you know, people share around privacy manuals and how to be secure online, but the mass of people have no understanding of how to do that. There is still an ever-increasing kind of trove of information out there, if you know how to find it, that is materially useful to anti-fascist movements. And it has been, um, there is, there's a group uh, of which I am peripherally involved with in the UK called Red Flare, who have, have made use of this information quite a lot. In, in providing investigations for The Times and, and other newspapers uh, in the UK, as well as publishing their own research. Unless anyone had anything uh, else to say, I was going to move on to the next question. I was just going to say about the German case, right? So there's there's the thing called the... Um, uh, I'm going to pronounce, horribly mispronounce this. Um, uh, Reichsbewegung it means it means it means um reich's people's movements or reich citizens movements in german and it's essentially a kind of a like a german q and and so i was going to say like the, the the main way in which um things like fascist and, and, and nazi sentiment i think get uh kind of channeled because they are definitely there in german society i'm not not denying that there's like a, a problem with neo-nazis in german there obviously is but uh, the way in which they get channeled is into, into these much more peculiar, much more conspiratorial, much more syncretic movements like QAnon in the US, right? There's no part of US politics more well stated, and this is true for the UK as well, than that than we don't like Hitler. Right? Like Hitler is the ultimate enemy, even for much of the, U, the US far right, because what justifies the US's place in the world is the moral authority it gets from crushing artism, right? It crushes fascism. It's capitalist. It's not. It's not fascist. It's not communist. And it, it, it defeats both these enemies. And that's what that's what gives the U.S. It's like a, it's it's it, it's right to hegemony, right? It's it's a right by conquest of the global order. Um, and the U.K., although it's not, I don't think, hegemonic in the same way as the U.S., um, nevertheless has a, um, it also thinks about that right very deeply. And therefore, there's a need to not express fascism in terms of like you know Zeke Heiling and. Uh, Roman salutes and you know, uh, you're doing silly walks in the streets. Like, there's a need to kind of express it in these different peculiar ways, and that's obviously much more acute and much more kind of concrete in Germany, where getting you where waving a swastika in the street will not only get you prescribed like it would in the UK or punched in the head like it would in Germany uh, in, in the US, sorry, but also get you arrested and thrown in jail. I will say I was warned not to wear my RAF shirt when I was in Germany because apparently it is illegal to wear symbols of the RAF, which is. Interesting, but definitely not the same scale as what you're talking about with swastikas. No, that's a good point. I appreciate that. A major contradiction in far-right thought often is a simultaneous uplifting of the capital I individual as a downtrodden elite, um, as well as the subsumption of that individual to a leader who represents the greatest possibilities of the collective. This is kind of adjacent to the too many fears in the Reich problem. And this brings us to the topic of grifters and influencers. I feel like looking back to the position of the alt-right generally as an umbrella, its street power and media presence, there was an amazing groundswell of talking heads and, and swarms of neckbeards and trads ready to show up in the streets you know, during the heady days of 2016 through 2019. Where are those influencers and swarms now? Have they retreated to walled gardens online or been successfully de-radicalized and re-radicalized towards a, an anti-racist position? And I wonder if you um, have any anecdotes that you want to share. Um, well, I think these things are, again, fairly um, hard to track. Um, obviously, the, the alt-right collapsed quite spectacularly and and what we've we've said in, in its place has become these massively fragmented subcultures 
and and kind of micro movements in in between the the bigger things that still remain. For example, the followers of Nick Fuentes, for example, a Proud Boys would be, would be another example of that. And of course, ultimately QAnon. Now it's not clear that the alt right, you know, kind of morphed into QAnon. I think QAnon comes from a different place, really, and it's not made up for the same demographics. But what we think is going to happen is these kind of fragmentary bits and pieces of online far right sub um, subcultures and or online far right activity are going to kind of re- reform themselves in some in some form, and we're we're seeing beginning to see those kind of moves happening behind the activity for, for example in January 6th we had a had a had an episode on at the time you can see some of those movements coming in behind it and going forward in defense of it and in defense of that of Trump's actions in the run up and on the day of January 6th you can see formations occurring and most importantly we've seen the capitulation of the Republican party to much much ex- more extreme explicit far right and movements and ideas than they ever were in you know the Trump era. Trump kind of opened the door um, in many respects to these things, and there was a, a general kind of acceptance of the of the quote unquote crazies um, in order to kind of give their sclerotic party some kind of vitality. But what we're seeing is that is those kinds of people now being more institutionalized within the party and much more open and explicit relationships as well. And so you know the kind of danger of this is is that. You know, the alt-right, it was always difficult to work out, you know, when it did kind of materialise in the streets, it was always quite chaotic, always quite incoherent in many ways. You, you saw that in Charlottesville where there was lots of people there, but it was all very cacophonous. What we, the danger, of course, is if, if this kind of move, if these kind of online movements are adopted by the Republican Party, which it, it seems like increasingly like it is, these forms, these very extreme forms of politics and very reactionary forms of politics will be given an institutional form. Um, and, you know, we can expect to see, um, you know, much more bigger, much bigger, much more consequential changes in, in, in government in the US uh, because of it. Yeah, that's also my sense of how things have moved. There's a kind of a shift from this kind of micro-influencer model where people are often directly monetizing through being on uh, different platforms where they show adverts or through kind of super chats and this kind of thing, directly monetizing their capacity to talk to camera, essentially, on far topics in the period 2015 to 2018 or thereabouts. And then there's a kind of decline of that economy. Like there's, there's a, you know, like a, a, a recession, essentially, in demand for, for this. And there's a consolidation around a few very key influences. The other really important part here is that is, is the rise in America of Tucker Carlson. And the kind of the increasing centrality of Tucker Carlson to the American uh, media landscape, because Tucker Carlson, unlike say Bill O'Reilly before him, will say the kind of more or less extreme things that the U.S. right were uh, were saying amongst themselves, uh, that the far right was saying amongst themselves with these micro influencers. But he'll do it in a way that's much more, you know, slick, sarcastic. Um, he's much better at interviewing people than anyone else is. He, he knows much more than other people, uh, and he's got an extremely clearly defined political worldview. He's not incoherent. He's not he's not kind of difficult to listen to. Whenever he like something kind of embarrassing happens on his show, it's the it's to the embarrassment of the other person on the show. Right? He's very good at like not embarrassing himself, um, and just like in this this like kind of existence of Tucker Carlson on TV, like these micro influencers just can't compete. In the same way as you know, the uh, local bookshop can't compete with Amazon, right? It's the same dynamics. Tucker Carlson is Amazon; he's just like taking all your all your demand, right? And so there's, there's a sense in which I think that's the really one of the important parts of it. Also, Tucker Carlson allows for direct connection between the movement and this institutional structure, right? Like you know, he can just ring up the Supreme Court justices, right? And so there's a connection which no one on the on the far right was able to do. Like Richard Spencer does not have like <laughs> the Clarence Thomas's uh, like phone number, obviously, but Tucker Carlson does, right? So and there's there's kind of ability to, to like map together these different parts of the far right, obviously. There's also a kind of a sense in which that seems much more palatable to the Republican Party, to, to donors and so on, which is where the, the kind of the motor of, of, of this stuff comes from. And I would assume that those big funders which, who fund lots of the US far right are breathing a sigh of relief that Richard Spencer is no longer the force he was or like many people on the alt-right are no longer the force they were, right? There's a kind of a sense of almost relief because everything is kind of coming back into the institutional setting and being kind of therefore much, I think, better coordinated 
amongst its various parts, which is why the far right as an institutional force is having so many victories in the US right now, even as the far right as a movement is splitting up and going in different directions and kind of yeah, not cohering in the same kind of way it was maybe uh, even last year or like maybe five years ago. If you would like to support The Final Straw, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow and share our materials online, as well as give us feedback via the links at thsr.wtf slash tree as in link tree. To support our transcription work and wider project, you can subscribe to us via patreon.com slash TFSR. You can also buy some merch or find donation methods at tfsr.wtf slash support. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. I'm going to make those pompous academics regret kicking out such a genius. Deciding to build my lab and do my research. The Time Talks Podcast. Have you ever stared at a 500-page book and wish you could just talk to the author about their ideas instead? If so, the Time Talks Podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network, is for you where we discuss history, politics, music, and art with an anti-authoritarian and anarchist perspective. The Time Talks Podcast. What's this light? I feel different. The Time Talks Podcast. And so you kind of talked about this in a recent episode of, of your podcast, or the last episode that, um, for instance, Sam, you were part of, about how this is not the approach in the UK that the the Conservative Party, the Tories, have t- towards holding power and towards pulling in um, folks from the extreme. Can you talk a, a little bit about that difference? Yeah, so the the, the Conservative Party is a it, it is an attempt really to respond to the, it's a flexible political organization, right, with a very long history, obviously, but a flexible political organization, which responds to the task it has, which is to govern British capitalism. And British capitalism is not US capitalism, which seems obvious, but they have you know, important key functional differences in their positions in the global economy. Um, the UK is a financial superpower, but it's not important as a military power. It's not important as a like a, um, a manufacturing power. It's kind of important as a cultural power. Like it has very famous institutions, the BBC, the NHS, the Royal Family. You know, it has like kind of things that it can export around the world as kind of institutional forms. You know, it's not for nothing that like a lot of the, the post-colonial constitutions, when people are kind of hunting around for a constitution to base their 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 economy their like their system on they they go for the us one or, or for the uk one or for the french one those are normally the three models that are employed like the uk is a big cultural power but mostly it's a financial empire right it's a, just a global financial power as we mean today that like 90 percent of like global <laughs> uh something is based i can't remember exactly what it was cut that bit out i'm reading about this for a seminar i've got to do but, uh, the information is not going properly and so it's so the task of managing that does not necessarily include questions of like the relationship between the UK and it's like military as a kind of heroic and unimpeachable guarantor of collective security, right? We don't have that relationship to the military in in, in, in the UK. You know, people walk around in their army uniforms in, uh, near where I live and it's just like you, no one stops them and thanks them for their service. Like, it's, not, it's not a thing. Right? Whereas the US is is the global hegemon right, whose function is to, through, you know, the, its institution of the petro dollar regime is to um, so make the US stay in that position by forcing everyone else to buy do, uh, dollars in order to, like, you know, uh, buy oil. And it guarantees that people will buy its oil and trade in oil by threatening to militarily intervene globally. And everyone else funds its military by keeping the dollar more powerful and more um you know, uh, stronger than it would otherwise be, right? So that's 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 the position of the US. In that position, you can well imagine that, like, being really intensely nativist in your politics, valorizing the military as a particularly impressive and unimpeachable and kind of valiant dimension of life, valorizing conquest and domination and violence, these are all integral parts of what American capitalism does on a global scale. And so there's, there's not, not so really surprise that those things come out in the politics. The other thing to say is that, of course, the U.S. is the U.K. Sorry, is a was you know, a, a colonial power, but the U.S. is still a colonial like situation, right? Still colonization going on in the U.S. It's it's, it's a live aspect, and so the, the kind of the unreconciled, the unfinished process of colonization uh, is the other kind of thing that I think informs the U.S., which doesn't inform the U.K. Uh, in in there is so much. Obviously, the U.K. is a colonial power, but it regards in its self conception colonization as having kind of ended in. 1948, right? Give back India, 
it's done. That's it. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the the way in which the UK likes to imagine itself as a colonial power. I think that's true. Alex is grimacing, <laughs> but like, uh, but I think that's the way the UK UK likes to imagine its relationship to colonialism. The thing about the Tories of, is that they they have an ability to absorb the far right political positions and energies without themselves and without actually inviting the far right into them necessarily all that much. And so, you know, you see it in various different waves of the far right activity in the UK. For example, that with the National Front, which kind of built in the late 1970s and, and was completely kind of absorbed by Thatcherism and Thatcher in a way. But, you know, it wasn't as if Thatcher became, a, you know, took on these far right elements into her party. It's that she took on their positions and stole their energy uh, and, and, and built Thatcherism and neoliberalism as it is along, you know, with agent you know people in the in the US as well in the same way the kind of the the sting that was taken out of the EDL and these kind of movements in the 2010s was the kind of very explicit institutionalization of of, a, of what Theresa May called um the hostile environment to 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 migrants to refugees and to asylum seekers you know we're going to make this a hostile environment to anyone who's coming into the country and that basically took away a lot of the kind of there was basically an adopt- adoption of far right politics without uh, adopting the far right, um, and you can see the kind of ingraining of that in, within the modern con- contemporary Conservative Party in things like the, the you know the, the the policy of deportations to Rwanda, which you know it's very unclear whether that's ever going to happen, um, whether they're actually going to go through with it, but was another another one of these moves of a kind of creeping authoritarianism designed to kind of um, explicitly geared against the kind of hippie lefties in Extinction Rebellion and the the disruptive elements of of various uh, movements and, and a clamping down on those things and most importantly clamping down on unapproved by the state migration. You know, I, I don't really know how to say it. You know, unofficial migration. So in some ways, like that description, kind of makes me think of the way that the Democratic Party in the U.S. relates to um, the progressive politics is sort of like absorbing, identifying itself with those causes, maybe absorbing individuals and then shifting them into neoliberal politics that they already had going on. But it appears in some ways to be like the party of labor, the party of immigrants, the party of um, multiculturalism or whatever, or feminism, but at the same time. A group that you've mentioned frequently on the show is Patriotic Alternative in the UK. Uh, and I wonder if you'd say a few words about where you see this group today and why you consider it to be um, a growing threat. In the US context, I know it it's not your fishbowl, as it is mine, but we do take up a lot of space. So I, I know you're like educated on what's going on on this side of the pond. Where do you... Where do you pin groups like Patriot Front in terms of um, level of threat as a street fascist group? So Patriot Alternative, for people who who don't know, is a UK fascist. And they, 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 they kind of dance around the, the term, but they, they are a pretty fascist organisation uh, founded by a guy called Mark Collette, who had a, an extensive career in the, in the British National Party, which was the last mass, mass fa- fascist like far-right party electoral party before they collapsed in in 2010 and what makes them kind of a particular threat is that they're entirely in at the moment they're entirely uninterested in in building through street demonstrations i.e building through through things that you know um are easily opposed by anti-fascists and and this is a break with a like a, a the kind of classic tactic of building uk far-right parties and movements which is this kind of approach that's called march and build. So you have a march, you bring people into the march, it's vital, it's exciting, they want to go to the next march. And you know, this is a classic case of the EDL where they kind of toured the country building these big marches. And, and then the idea is you grow your organisation on the back of these things. And the problem with that, of course, is that the, these kind of situations are become targets of anti-fascists and and once enough anti-fascist power has been built up or enough organisations happened, they are kind of opposed to the point where they're either smashed, as, ha- as got happened in a, in a couple of instances in, do- in, in, in confrontations in Dover, which was like, you know, hours of running street battles, basically, um, which resulted in about 50 members of the far right and fascists being sent to prison for kind of quite extensive prison sentences and about, you know, two or three anti-fascists receiving the same thing. There's obviously a, a, 
an unbalance there and ultimately that those instances destroyed that nascent movement that was growing in Dover. And what patriotic alternative are focusing on is what they call white community building. So it's a very private events and it's um they are part you know, their their politics are explicitly very racist. They talk about the extinction of the, the, the extinction of white people in the UK, they talk about um the need to deport non white people. It's very much a racial politics. But what they actually do, apart from the leafleting and whatever, is, you know, going on hikes or doing fitness activities and fitness clubs or, you know, these kind of private, very difficult to oppose things, which is meant to build this white community. And, you know, they have directory of white owned or white friendly businesses that they're founding. You know, there's a tea company, there's various different things. Um, And the idea is to build this kind of separatist, separatism, at least in the short term. Now, you know, Colette, the the leader of Petrick Alternative, you know, his history and his kind of political training is is in these confrontational marches. And it it feels like he's found a way to to build a base of power, both in number of activists that, you know, are are actively organising for Petrick Alternative without the opposition that goes along with it. And I think that there's a real danger that because they're quite hard to impose without having an extra level of information about their activities, you know, their private schedules, for example, or their, you know, you know, you don't get this stuff usually. And so anti-fascists, there's a danger that anti-fascists don't try to oppose them because it's very difficult to. And therefore, this kind of group is allowed to build itself essentially um, un- unimpeded. And what we do know is that that kind of form of organising has created a level of, I don't want to use the term softness because it's kind of a, it implies a kind of macho kind of thing, um, but it, 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 there's a there's a kind of fragility to the to the activists because they haven't been faced regular confrontation or because they're not like hardened street fighters like the UK far right scene has traditionally been. It means that when they do get opposed, it is actually fairly effective. And you know there was a there was an incident. In, in Kent a couple of years ago in which a, a PA hike walk was um, very severely disrupted and it took about two years for that group to get itself together again and reconstitute itself um, because there, was no, there, was, there wasn't that same kind of level of resilience. You know, in the 80s when you know, the, we had bands like Screwdriver, the lead singer of Screwdriver was regularly having his window smashed, was regularly getting beaten up on the street and was continuing to be a neo-Nazi singer and organising and organising blood and honour and all this kind of stuff. He, he kind of was had it as part of his lifestyle. And you can't say the same thing about um, PA today. And so one thing that has been successful has been these investigations that's been happening about them as well. The weight of the media has turned to them in, in recent months. There's been, there was a quite a interesting documentary about them on Channel 4 and, and things like this. And so I think the increased attention will um, draw more anti-fascists to opposing them, but it, it the, yeah, I'm going to stop. So the final chapter of Piffer shares some challenges to anti-fascist organizers, including the scope of our work and our vision, as well as our break out of subculture and into coalitions. Uh, for those of us who are trying to do this work, can you break down some of the pitfall, pitfalls and weak spots that um, that the book talks about or that you've um, come across that you want to share? Where do you see some room for improvement? Give us some tech mill. So I, I guess the there are two things I want to say. One is that we make a distinction in the book, or kind of sliding scale perhaps, between minimum and maximum anti-fascism. And uh, minimum anti-fascism is the, the actually fairly recent practice of anti-fascism, which is that you find the people who are doing the Zeke Isles or waving the swastikas, and you try and just stop them from organizing politically. There's no political content to that in the sense that it hasn't, you don't try and oppose them discursively. You don't try and like argue with them. You just try and stop them from organizing, right? And you do that against people who everyone would agree, possibly even them, that they are fascists, right? Or neo-Nazis or whatever, right? You, you, you oppose those groups. That's minimum anti-fascism. And there's maximum anti-fascism. And maximum anti-fascism is kind of at its fullest extent is just whatever it takes to stop the conditions for fascist organizing happening at all, right? So at the very limit of that, that means like transitioning to a non-capitalist society that doesn't revolve around impersonal domination as a whole, right? 
And so you can see there's a lot of sliding, there's a lot of stuff in, in the middle <laughs> between these two things. And I'm not saying that minimum anti-fascism is, is good or that like maximum anti-fascism is good. I'm just saying that there are attempts that, 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 that they are, they represent totally different poles of like a, a total anti-fascist strategy. And we're always moving between these two poles. And I think a lot of the mistakes of the anti-fascist movement have been down to an attempt basically to fixate on one of these two these two ends of the spectrum. You know, it's only anti-fascism if you're opposing people who are actually fascists, actually neo-Nazis operating on the streets, or it's only anti-fascism if you're you're doing the kind of the deep work of transforming the whole of society so that fascism is 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 not even possible anymore. And uh, you know, I think there are there are there are arguments in favor of, of both. Maximum anti-fascism is of course a much more difficult project in some ways, because it is just essentially the same as the left as a, a scale, but there are lots of kind of other medium anti-fascisms and so minimum anti-fascism is, is much more physically risky, much less politically risky, right? So it's like, there's a kind of a trade-off here between the, the two different kind of aspects of, of, of doing that work. So that's a general framework in which I think it'd be useful to think about, you know, the, the way in which anti-fascism is done as a strategic thing. And uh, obviously there's lots more in the book on that. The other thing that I think is a kind of a big pitfall about anti-fascism in general is that anti-fascism has a kind of a an uneven rhythm, right? I think I, I say sometimes that it's like a third or fourth order consequence of financial crises, which are by their nature unpredictable, right? There is a big financial crisis in capitalism. This becomes a crisis of unemployment or a crisis in the, the economy more generally. And then there are far right responses that mediate that crisis and try and turn it to something else, that mediate fury at the declining conditions of life and try and turn it into blame for Muslims, blame on you know, whoever it is. And then anti-fascism responds to that. And because of that, because you can't predict the sequence of kind of things that anti-fascism is responding to, you get into these situations where there is like long periods of time where there's just not a very clear far-right threat. And so at least in the UK, what's been happening, what has happened in the past, is that people have said, okay, well, we're anti-fascists. Must be something for us to oppose. <laughs> Let's find some fascists. And not kind of in some ways waiting for there to be some fascists. Right. And so you end up kind of conjuring people, boogeymen, for you to like oppose, uh, conjuring people who you might uh, regard as not particularly fascist, like Alex was talking about before, people who are bad in lots of ways, but are not adequately opposed by the kind of tactics that, that anti fascism has, has got useful for it or is able to use. And so, yeah, you simply having in the you know, proverbial hammer. And trying to find some proverbial nails, right, to, to 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 engage with, and because it's uneven rhythm, there's this there's this problem with it. And I think the solution to this problem is to not regard anti-fascism as an identity, right? You don't think of yourself, you shouldn't think of yourself as an anti-fascist. You think of someone yourself as someone who is temporarily fulfilling the role of being anti-fascist. And of course, the counter argument to this, and the thing that's always kind of kept in tension with, is that there are specific skills. That certainly people who are involved in minimum anti-fascism need certain practices they need to be good at, certain ways of keeping information secure, certain ways of organizing together, certain physical training even, certain ways of coordinating on the street, you need to be good at. But somehow we need to get good at those things without thinking, okay, that means that I'm the anti-fascist. And that means that I know exactly what fascism is. And that means I know exactly when it's come and when it hasn't. I know exactly how to oppose it. And I'm the expert and everyone should you know, follow my lead because then we end up in this kind of Peculiar subcultural authoritarianism. I think, yeah, we've all we've all we've all encountered that 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 uh, in the past and uh, and know its risks. There's also just on the on the coalition building as well. I think that there's often a danger that anti-fascists come in to build these coalitions and then expect them to be, you know, kind of permanent things that last, uh, that have longevity instead of like recognizing that a bunch of like organizations and kind of networks that are dedicated to liberatory politics have their own politics and their own activism that they're doing all the time anyway and you know they're campaigning around housing and and, and racial justice and whatever and you can't turn any, everything into everything into anti-fascism anti-fascism should be ultimately opening up space for these liberatory movements to be able to do good stuff you know and to, to be defensive of attacks on them but also just um recognize when you need to kind of fade back a counter to that again 
is that there is a there is a benefit. You know, we we critique subcultural politics, and I, I think you need to critique it. You need to be building out beyond all the time. But there is a use in having these kind of anti-fascist bands, for example, or you know, anti-fascist red gyms or you know, training groups or whatever. And there is a use to having that connection to it, to an ongoing history of of resistance and struggle. And and to lose connection with that history or to to not understand your anti-fascist history is to kind of lose some of that kind of generational knowledge, lose some of that kind of generational kind of meaning. You know, the Spanish Civil War, the resistance in the Spanish Civil War has meaning to anti-fascists today, and, and rightly so. And so we, we shouldn't, like, you know, kind of let all that aside. And I think we're both kind of teasing out these kind of tensions. You you can't go one way or the other. You've got to find uh, find your, the happy place in that tension, I think. And it seems like, I mean, yeah, find the happy place in that... that that position is going to shift as needs be and so be flexible enough to be able to to find what makes sense for the moment on that on that spectrum oh one thing that i've heard about um in the uk mostly over the show more than in any other source has been the concept of proscription and i don't know if that's just the illegalization of a group or if that has like what the legal consequences of that are um, I, I feel like that's a, yeah, it's um, Combat 18 or like, I don't know if BNP, like British National Party or like these other groups are examples of of groups that have been prescribed. I wonder what the consequences are of of being in a group that's prescribed. And also in your view, dealing with the government, I mean, we've had recently a number of charges brought against in the United States context, uh, Proud Boys. Um, in relation to the January 6th um, putsch or whatever. And I think anti-fascists here have various views on how that feels. I mean, fuck around and find out. And that's just, you know, you, if, you, if, you, if you try to overthrow the U.S. government, there's going to be consequences from the U.S. government. But I'm sure that there are some liberal, liberal people who call themselves anti-fascists who are promoting this sort of approach or people who after January 6th were using their resources or research tools in order to feed information specifically to the FBI or to law enforcement. Um, and I kind of wonder just what your thoughts are in terms of the concept of the three-way fight that not only is um, the, ex- ex- the government is not our friend, uh, fascists are not our friend, and that as anti-fascists or as people that are doing anti-fascist work, it's questionable about whether or not it's a positive when the government is able to gain upper hand and say, look, we've done the anti-fascist thing. We are anti-fascists. Join the NSA. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll take the prescription part and you, maybe you can take the next bit. OK, so prescription is one of the most repressive instruments that the UK state has available to it. And it's not even a matter of passing a law or anything. It's a decision of the Home Secretary, you know, under consultation of civil servants, but ultimately it's on her to to prescribe groups. Prescription brings along a a number of criminal offences. It becomes a crime to be a member of that organisation. And it basically becomes a crime for that organisation to continue existing. And also the crime carries a sentence of years in prison, you know, up to 10 years in prison. And... What we've seen how that works in practice is after National Action got prescribed, which was the first far right group organisation in the UK to be to be prescribed, is that people were going to prison for being members of National Action after prescription for around four years. So four years in prison is a is a very significant, you know, sanction. Um, it also becomes a, a crime to speak positively in public or materially support, morally support that group, that band organisation uh, in in public, publicly declare your moral support or to raise money for them, for example, as well. And it's also a, becomes a crime to found a new organisation that's basically the old organisation under another name or made up of the same members. And obviously this is, you know, this is like a, kind of a very terrifying power that is available and its ability you know, obviously rests on basically one person, which is the Home Secretary. And it's something, of course, that you would never have in, in the US. You know, the the First Amendment is, sac- is you know, sacred, sacrosanct in regards to the, these forms of political organising. Now, you know, obviously there's many other kind of techniques and, and, and kind of instruments that are available to the US and indeed the UK in which you can effectively uh, make the, the kind of 
the leaders of political organisations, um, you know, heavily discourage them of continuing or even, you know, take them out completely. Um, you know, you can see some of the, you know, tactics of the FBI when, you know, opposing the civil rights movement, for example, you know, there's these all kinds of like um, very illegal or very kind of repressive things that happen there uh, and, and this kind of thing. And, you know, later, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement as well, you've seen the similar kind of repression from state police and from the FBI as well. So that's prescription. And, you know, there's been discussion, just going back to patriarchal alternative, you know, they've been really desperate to keep the taint of national action away from them and to keep that kind of prescription talk away from them as well. You know, to, uh, and they've done that to some, de- some success. The, the question to anti-fascists is, do you want to try and provoke that instrument being used? Uh, you know, do you want to, uh, you know, you highlight and publicise links to national action which could attract a, a, a prescription order? I would say, you know, the most desirable way to oppose is, is a kind of mass movement and anti-fascism that can oppose them physically and ide- ideologically in the communities in which they're working. Um, but there's oftentimes there's a kind of misconception of how the what the state how the state operates in that it's, it's kind of seen as an anti-fascist thing as a, as an instrument that can be used, or you know, and so the pro- the problem is is of course that the, the the first point is that of course the state can start can ban radical left groups just as much if the if it has the justification if it has the kind of way laid out for it considering the circumstances. There's other, like, as you brought up, like, there are other, I just looked it up really quickly. I was like, I've never heard of people, like, of the proscription of left-wing groups, but I was just like, was the Irish National Liberation Army a proscribed group? And, like, at least Wikipedia tells me, yes. So it's not a a tool that's only wielded against the far right, right? So the case case of Ireland is very, is a a separate, is specific as well. And that a lot of the prescription orders that that are taking place in, in the... Island of Britain um, are modelled on on the island of Ireland, the stuff that was happening there. But they are they are distinct. You know, the, the, that kind of that politics and that history is distinct in the UK. I would say. Yeah, but there are all kinds of legal instruments that are used in Northern Ireland uh, that are like different uh, and like in quite in quite like market ways. Uh, it's a it's a colony, right? So it's like a it'll, it'll be policed differently from the from, from the mainland. I think I think what we what we've been consistently doing for in our answers to the last kind of three or four questions actually has been articulating basically a kind of a feel of tensions, right? On the one hand, this, but also on the other hand, this, right? And then and there's a sense in which there is a kind of a there are not particularly good or easy answers. I have contradictory thoughts, as you can imagine, about prescription as an instrument wielded by the state. I think that it's it's actually not impossible that it would be um, done in the U.S. Because the explicit justification of the, in the UK is not um, that they said bad things, right? It's that they, they advocated for terrorism, and and and, uh, and in the US, advocating for violence is not protected speech. Um, so, like you, know, you, 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 that that that's not covered by the First Amendment. You can, you know, if you threaten someone directly, uh, you can be arrested for that. Like as far as I understand, I, mean, I think that's, that's basically true, isn't it? But there is no list of um, domestic terrorist organizations, for instance, and th- that's usually right. the framing for. Yeah. Um, so it would be it would be framed within, as opposed to an ideological argument around like criminal specific activity, yeah. and prosecuted as as criminal activity. So this is this is what's really interesting about the Canadian case, right? So in Canada, they uh, prescribed three organizations at the same time: Atom Waffen, the Base, and the Proud Boys. And we, just before we came on, we were talking about like the difference. Is that because those. they're all run by the FBI? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was. You're not the first state. person who's Over- made that joke to us. Um, no, so the, 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 when we were talking before we came on. I, I was just thinking these were very different organizations. I think I would maintain that they are. Atom often, if people don't know, had like maybe 50 members at its height, something like that. And like of those, six committed some sort of murder. Right, like that's that's a very high rate of murder. Um, the base uh, had maybe slightly more members. It was like a supposedly international network, though overwhelmingly based in the US, but with members in the UK and Sweden and Canada and so on, and Russia as well, um, where uh, it turned out that the leader was staying for reasons that are completely unconnected from the uh, the the shadowy world of, of, of spooks and have nothing to do with the uh, uh, the decline of the Soviet Union or the CIA or anything. Nothing to do with it. Anyway. And, and then the Proud Boys, right, which is a 
um, uh, a, 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 sh a Western chauvinist like drinking club, essentially, that had been responsible for uh, an immense amount of political violence in the streets, but who, to my knowledge, had never committed like kind of terroristic murders, like kind of sporadic basis. And of course, we can argue about the definition of terrorism right, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a category. I think it's a, the fact that terrorism has been kind of the category terrorism is a mark of the distinction that is made between like politics proper and violence in politics, right? And it's, it, they tend to police that boundary. You know, proper politics is discursive. People talk about things, they argue heatedly. You know, terrorism is when there's kind of discriminate, indiscriminate killing of, 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 of innocent people, right? That's not a stable boundary. And the Proud Boys, by kind of wandering around on that boundary, have made it much more difficult for these kind of uh, prescription legislation in, in, in Canada to, to, to be enacted clearly. But I think it's still quite peculiar because I think really what is, is aimed at is not violence, right, but a certain kind of unacceptable politics, right, a politics of extremity. And undoubtedly, Atom Woffen had that politics of extremity, right? Atom Woffen's organizing principle was that it was the most extreme organization on the far right, right? That was its, that was its advertising, its USP, right? It was like, one of their main organizers called himself rape. Yeah. Whereas the Proud Boys didn't have that. And so I think there's a kind of a complicated thing about who gets prescribed. And if I was going to say that prescription shouldn't be used or should be abandoned as a measure, it would be about that level of political inarticulacy or political misunderstanding on the part of the Canadian state, which I would assume the Home Secretary of Canada is no less well informed the Home Secretary of the UK. I don't know who the Home Secretary of Canada is. It's not. It's not of interest to me, uh, but, but but I think it's it's uh, yeah that that it would be on the basis of that kind of obviously wrong decision that I would I would for a serious question the the use of prescription. As to your second book, the rise of ecofascism, um, what do you mean by the term ecofascism, and what is far right ecologism? How do they relate, and are there any contemporary examples you think are especially informative for the audience? So I think we promised earlier, or at least Alex promised earlier, that there would be a definition of fascism. So we, we're now getting to that. But first of all, <laughs> we have to ask answer another question, right? Which is the which is the question of what is far right politics, and I think far right politics is basically again in this kind of unclear zone at the edges of liberalism, right? Far right politics is a is a collection like all politics are, I think, collection of suggestions and practices for reproducing social roles and relations that utilize tactics that are unacceptably brutal. For liberalism, right? Liberalism won't accept the far right as part of itself, but nevertheless, the far right is a necessary part of the reproduction of liberalism as a whole, right? So liberal states need their violent border regimes. They need, to some extent, far right movements to um, kind of uh, to scare the left. They need ways for the anger of politics to be articulated, the anger uh, that and the, the, the daily humiliation of like you know the working class produces in politics right they need somewhere for that to go and so the far right is a useful aspect of liberalism fascism is something quite peculiar within that more general category of the far right in that it seeks to unify different parts of the political forms that the far right kind of contains so i would say there are basically broad, three broad political forms there's there's electoral politics or like politics of the government there's politics of movements, and there's the politics of violence, or extrajudicial violence in particular. Obviously, governments contain violence, movements contain violence to some extent as well. And this tripartite, sep this tripartite separation is not some sort of eternal law of how politics works, but is, is specific to the history of neoliberal capitalism in particular, right? So the fact that movements can't get themselves heard in government or can't transform the practice of governments which we've seen in the US with Bernie Sanders and so on, or um, the, the kind of movement version of the Labour Party that we have with Jeremy Corbyn. The fact that there is no relationship between the politics of movements and the politics of the government is a, is a, is a split that is produced by neoliberalism deliberately. The fact there is a split between movements and terroristic violence, the kind of sp the split that um, prescription legislation tries to police, right? that is a product, I think, largely of the Second World War and the kind of horror that fascism represented for liberalism. And so what has happened since the Second World War is that the security state has become much, 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 much more powerful. Right? Like there are no movements that are able to physically overwhelm 
the power of uh, a national police force. Obviously, you had this kind of weird exception in January the 6th in, in the US, but it was very quickly stamped out. And now the FBI, which is extraordinarily well equipped, extraordinary surveillance state and so on, you know, is now like coming down very, very hard on people who who dared to to defy uh, its kind of capacity to to to, to organize the, the structure of violence in society or to have that monopoly on violence that defines the uh, the contemporary state. And so there is a split between these three different parts. Fascism is a political product that attempts to unify their interests, to make governments work with terrorists or what are now described as terrorists, but extrajudicial violence in general, to work with movements. And it's kind of the unification of these three parts. Now, the way it does that is by presenting a notion of the unified nat nation, the whole nation state. And that is mediated through ideas of nature and the natural law, but also like physical natural landscapes. And it's that that we describe as ecofascism. So you have what we describe in the book as fire ecologism, which can be from any of these different parts. You can have a governmental fire ecologism, you can have a movement fire ecologism, and you can have a terroristic fire ecologism. But it's when these three things have come together as a political unity, when you get you know governments that are not doing the kind of reflexive thing that contemporary fire governments do, which is say, oh, these terrorists, it's terrible, it's terrible, you know that he was crazy. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, he, he's he was on the left, as the um, uh, Kellyanne Conway wanted to frame the, the Christchurch shooter, you know, equating environmentalism with the left, as, of course, the US far right has frequently equated fascism with the left. It's a big movement of kind of some form of collectivity. So that's what ecofascism is. It's a, it's a coordination of these three elements mediated through a notion of the, the natural whole. And the danger of it over the, the, the kind of the period that we're looking at in the future, the next 50 years or so, is that these three parts of the political separation of neoliberalism will start to, to re-cohere and become uh, coherent again. And that's the real kind of the, the, the real kind of terror that I think lies in, in the notion of ecofascism. All that's to say, there aren't particularly good examples right now, right? Because we're looking at an emergent political formation rather than look, pointing at people who have eco-fascist views. Because as we kind of repeatedly, I think, try to get across, the important thing is not what people believe. Right? The important thing is what people are able to enact upon the world. And that means that the, the question of politics is not just like who is saying the wrong thing or who has the wrong beliefs, but like how does the, the whole social structure of society shift and change and uh, fall under the sway of the control of like real eco-fascist movements. And that is not happening yet. Together. But just to, to build off what Sam was saying about um, eco-fascism, you know, oftentimes, you know, we have to think about this in the context of the climate crisis. And the, you know the the increasingly worsening conditions of life that are going to happen in the next you know are already happening and are going to continue to happen in the next few decades you know basically for the rest of, of both our lives all of our lives and that one of the responses to this increasingly desperate situation that we're all facing you know people in the global south obviously facing it now and going to face it much worse but you know no one you know people in the west are going to face it too in in America there are certain areas that are increasingly becoming completely uninhabitable you see what's happening in texas with the power grid um which fails in cold and fails in heat you know see what's happening in arizona with the water levels you know incredibly dire situation for for an area in which millions of people live the answer is that in these deficit situations we need to turn to some form of far-right authoritarian environmentalism in order to make the make the changes that we need to happen you know make them on a on a state top-down state level uh, the only way to do that is some kind of increasingly, um, you know, eco-fascist or whatever you want to, however you want to kind of kind of state structure or state intervention. And, you know, there's a many problems with this. One is the obvious one. It is that kind of authoritarianism comes along with a whole bunch of repressive actions, you know, oppression, uh, the, you know, kind of exclusion of, of people based on their race and, you know, intensification of, of misogyny and, and all these kind of things that are attendant to, to these, this kind of ramping authoritarianism, which we must oppose and which we probably will be left entirely unequipped to oppose um, if these kind of authoritarian state instruments are kind of re-instituted and re-justified. You know, we, you know, in the UK, there's this tendency of the Tories to every time there's some kind of thing in the news or thing protesting that they don't like, they'll immediately come out with a new law that will, will ban it. And so the example for that is the Extinction Rebellion and, and the groups that came out of them were kind of very used the tactic of locking on to various things to be to lock their bodies onto various 
bits of infrastructure and roadways and and you know to disrupt to, to be as difficult to be as difficult to remove as possible and that's not a crime you know locking your body to another piece of infrastructure is not a crime but they've brought in a law that has made it a crime and has a, a prison sentence attached to it and if these kind of authoritarian instruments are kind of instituted it means that those kinds of movements that we need these movements movements of liberation are made harder and harder and harder and harder the other problem with specifically eco-fascist politics is that it only operates on the national scale and of course we're not operating on a national scale we can we can't do that this is a global crisis and and so you know for example the Rassemble National in France talk about protecting the French landscape a kind of green nationalism what they mean by that is to export their kind of environmental de degradation out of France and to, to kind of preserve France in some kind of bubble of, 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 you know, kind of Western landscapes and all this kind of stuff. And this is, you know, obviously inadequate in, in, in so many different ways. Yeah. And without a fundamental, uh, fundamental rejection of capitalism, for instance, whether or not you're arguing national borders or not, you're absolutely ignoring the, like, one of the essential things that has been contributing and creating the scenario that has put us in the situation that we're in right now. Yeah, and I, and I also feel like that for neoliberal, for like the, these neoliberal governments and states, the situation would have to get so dire to us for, to attract a kind of authoritarian response. But it, it, it's going to be too late, in my opinion. Like, like you can just see it now with the way people talk about the cost of living crisis in the UK and, and you know the global instability and the oil price and the war in Ukraine. It seems to me that every answer to a global crisis is to drill for more oil in many ways. You know, Russia is this oppressive authoritarian imperialist power. We need to increase our national oil production. We need to convince Saudi Arabia to drill more oil for us, you know, this kind of stuff. And of course, um, in the UK, the, the, the government has started to revive these North Sea oil projects and fracking, um, shale, gra shale gas drilling in, in America as a response you know as a kind of thing we need energy independence we need uk energy independence when obviously once you've got that infrastructure in place capitalism is going to extract as much profit out of it as it can before they have to decommission it and so the the key thing is stopping these projects from happening and once it's extracted it's going to get used um well exactly. uh, since i have had you on for a very long time um I want to go to my guilty pleasure question of the last one. It may not be a guilty pleasure. It may be like perfectly reasonable question. Um, okay. It's mostly, is, is that okay? The Ted, the, the, Oh Uncle yeah. Ted yeah. Question? I'm, I'm interested to hear what your guilty pleasure is. Well, yeah. So I like, I came out of an anti-civilization green anarchist position um, at, at a certain point, but I have always felt like I've had an allergic reaction to the misanthropy in it. So um, this is sort of, of me reacting in my older age as I continue to see the misanthropy perpetuated. Um, an element of anti-fascist organizing that I find really important is working to shift hegemony in contested spaces, which you talk a little bit about in, in that latter book. It feels like in these contested spaces, we have an immediate agency in pushing hegemonic cultural values. And it's also spaces where we have the most in common with other participants or a lot in common with other participants. And so have like the leverage to change people's minds and hearts. I've been a bit disturbed by the resurgence and uplifting of Ted Kaczynski in recent years among some anarchists. And this goes back. I mean, he's identified himself as an anarchist in the past. Green Anarchist Magazine in the U.S. had a dialogue with him for a while. Crime Think put out stickers um, saying, like, um, Uncle Ted for president or something like that in 2000. Oh, I didn't know like that. Some edgelord thing. There was a recent TV show about him. Anyway, but uh, you, you've alluded a few times in the latter book um, with headings like far-right ecologism and its future, um, and, and referenced um, eco-extremist acolytes, ITS, or individualites teniendo a la salvaje in Mexico, um, that you list as an example of a climate collapse cult. One can find themes in Kaczynski's writings, including in his manifesto, warning of the mitigation of natural scarcity through technology, leading to the weakening of the essence of humans. Also, essentialist ideas around gender, sexuality, and disability, a post-left position embraced by Anders Breivik in his manifesto and other places um, by other dastardly people. Misanthropy and concerns about overpopulation mixed in with 
nativism can be encountered in the writings of Edward Abbey, as you all noted in an earlier chapter of the ecofascism book, and the early founders of Earth First, such as Dave Foreman, notably. While the adherents of these sorts of ideas are quite fringy in the general population, and they're, they're very few in number, so are anarchists and other libertarian, libertarian Marxists or like other people that I consider to be comrades. Can you talk a bit about contested spaces and, if you can, a little bit about Uncle Ted? Okay, I can see why this is the guilty pleasure question. It's a very long question. <laughs> so this is a really interesting point, because what we've been talking about for the most part in this interview, and indeed with much of the books, is, is not how kind of a pr- reactionary, and I think we could can label the people who coalesce around Ted Kaczynski's reactions as reactionary in many respects, or leading to reaction positions. We've talked about these kind of reactionary influences in society at large. We talk about borders, we talk about these movements and the left opposing the right. And we we have didn't speak much about within these spaces that we are that are our own spaces, what what we can do in them. And I think Kaczynski in the manifesto in particular has a really interesting place within both far right and far left kind of discourses. Um and of course there's a there's a far right online subculture which I don't know if you're familiar with called um Pine Tree Twitter. Hmm. Um which actively valorizes Kaczynski and his writing. And there, there is indeed, uh, if you read some of what Pine Tree Twitter writes about, there is an overlap between kind of misanthropic valorization of nature above all else, uh, valorization of wilderness above all else, for example, and the kind of generalized misanthropy against the modern world and, and, and the, the modern human with all his or her comforts and, and, and this kind of thing. And it's not something that in the spaces I've been a part of in, in the UK that I have particularly encountered. I understand that um, there's, a, there's a, you know, an anarchist bookshop in London which, of which I'm a part of. And there is kind of a generally agreed that certain kind of anti-civ writers, not, I mean, not all, um, but certain particular anti-civ writers are not acceptable to have in the shop and, 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 and this kind of thing. Uh, I think going forward... A lot of, a lot, a lot of the, a lot of the purchase of Kaczynski's writing is carried by the violence he carried out. It's carried out by the bombings and the kind of mystique that surrounded him. And I, I saw that TV show about him and the investigation to him too. And it, it, it's that TV show, but kind of translated within into kind of radical spaces. And if Kaczynski had not done those killings, done those bombings, he would, he would certainly not. Those writings would not have had the same kind of widespread uh, kind of influence that they, they, they did have. So I think it's hard because a lot of those kind of anti-civ types, like I, I would be very finickety about the definitions again. Like I don't think they're, obviously I don't think they're fascist and I don't think they should be opposed uh, in using anti-fascist tactics. I think what we need is a, a kind of more robust way of explaining collapse, explaining civilization, and explaining alternatives to that civilization. And so, anti civ has ultimately the right ideas uh, in the right kind of direction of travel, I suppose, in that we need to see that the, this civilization can't continue as it is because it is destroying the planet. But the, the question is one, what tactics are opened up in opposing that? You know, what is acceptable to do to other human beings and what isn't acceptable to do to other human beings? And two, what kind of world do we want to build? Is it a world built on the kind of exclusion of people who need certain things within the civilization in order to live? Now, obviously, the, the go-to here is um, people who, who rely on certain medications that have been produced in the contemporary capitalism, but also, you know, trans people, for example, as well. A certain anti-civ response is to declare trans people unpersons, you know, freaks of contemporary society who will either cease to exist once civilization collapses or will need to be eliminated in some form uh, societally. It's, and similarly for uh, people with disabilities, you know, the, the same thing applies. Like, these people are left aside. That's one path. The other path is one of extending and strengthening and kind of all-encompassing solidarity with every person who lives in this world as it is now and how we can transition together into some kind of new world, whatever that is. And there's obviously massive discussions about how we get there and how we kind of, what that looks like. 
Um, but I think the key thing is, um, and what we, we talk about in the conclusion of the book is, the key thing here is solidarity. You need to have solidarity with everyone, all, all different kinds of people with their experiences and their relationships to the world and their identity within that world as well. Did, did, was that adequate? <laughs> That's great. Yeah, we solved the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. It's, this is going to be in the, in the show notes, but um, would you mind saying a few places where people can find, um, find the books, find uh, the, the, you know, the 12 Rules Project online, social media, whatever, um, and, and sort of engage with you all? Yeah, so with the books, one is available from Polity Press, the eco fashion book, and I believe that has now had an American release, and so it's available to purchase domestically in America. Um, the, the first book, Puss Internet Far Right, is from Dog Section Press, and I don't think that does have American distribution, which is a shame, but what I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll check with the publisher and, and see what they say about it, because I think, I'm sure there must be some distro, uh, there should be anyway. Um, online, uh, we have a Twitter at 12 Rules for What, which we put out our episodes on, and we have a Patreon if people want to support, but um, you obviously don't have to. We run book clubs through there, um, and it's open to subscribers, but also if you want to just get in on joining and discussing the book, you can DM us and we'll we'll get you in, and it's not a big deal. Um, we have the Patreon to, to you know, pay our uh, RSS fees or whatever it is, and it's not we're not trying to make a a particular career out of podcasting necessarily and you can follow sam's new project on his substack and it's called collapsology.substack.com it's a newsletter and he writes it every thursday as for what we've got coming out next we're going to have another episode on patrick alternative and fascist fitness as a kind of historical trend and a contemporary trend and we're going to have a conversation with about um QAnon in america and transphobia and lgbtq um phobia <laughs> <I don't know>. homophobia <laughs> um which will be coming out very soon as well that's awesome i really look forward to and um alex thanks a lot for having the conversation thanks thanks best and now some words from anarchist prisoner sean swain what you say what you say Uh, the American public school system is in the midst of an unparalleled crisis. And the solutions now being implemented in response to that crisis are likely to cause the entire system to implode. Too bad it can't happen faster. Two years ago this month, the F-